You are listening to the Intrepid Radio Program with Scotty Roberts. Intelligent Talk. Well, happy Wednesday evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining my show. This is Scotty Roberts, the Intrepid Radio Program, right here on the Odyssey Radio Network. And you can come and hear the audio and listen to all the different, uh, or find and locate all the different streams that this plays on and terrestrial stations over at odyssey1.com. That's O-D-Y-S-Y-1. Dot com. And you can come and join me and the Intrepids in the live simulcast on my YouTube video stream. And that is at youtube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. Come and join in the fun over there. And today I have a lot of things I wanted to do today to bring up. I had a couple of book reviews. I wanted to read something from a book for you. A little excerpt to give you an idea of some good things fitting into the theme of what we've been talking about the last couple of days of reading to your kids, instilling spirituality in your kids, and so on. But I'm going to save that for another time because there's something else I want to talk about. And I hope not to be, hear hear my words clearly on this, I hope not to be too maudlin or over-emotional um, because I want to share with you something about the death of a friend, and it dredges up emotion, and if, if most of you know me by now, you know that uh, my emotions can sometimes be right below the surface on things, <coughs> and while I don't have a problem showing my emotions, um, this is supposed to be a professional radio show, and I want to give you some things, but this is a highly emotive topic. And why, might you ask, would I want to talk about something highly emotive? Um, It's because I think it's something we all experience. It's part of life. Death, as most of us have figured out by now, is a part of life. And while we live on, the death of others that are close to us can be things that really change our perspective on things. I have the unique uh, perspective, as with probably many of you and in many of your experiences, where I have been at death's door. I have gone knocking, um, not by my own will, of course, but by things that happened to me, health issues and so on, Uh, heart attack, heart surgery, things like that. How many times have we been at death's door and maybe not realized it. I have a unique perspective in the sense that I have been in a situation where I didn't realize it until after the fact how close I was to death. And that has a way of molding the way you think about your life afterwards. We sometimes get complacent. Uh, We sometimes lapse back into, even I've done this, uh, lapse back into normal life because things normalize. But deep in the in, in your psyche is built in now that new adjustment switch that says you may have fewer days left than you have behind you. And so what do you do with that time? Um, a death, either contemplating one's own death or seeing those around you who pass on, has a way of, at least for me, making me focus a bit more on those irreplaceable moments of time. My friend who just passed on a few days ago, and it was totally unexpected. An otherwise seemingly healthy man, 53 years old, Uh, a wife, a 15-year-old daughter, a good, caring, loving man, 
I don't know all the details, but uh, the way I've heard it passed in the night. He had a pulmonary embolism uh, in the lung, and it took him just, you know, like that. And he was gone. And did he, had he known, or if any of us knew what day death was coming, would we do things differently? So, in this whole thing we've been talking about in raising spiritual, spiritual kids, helping our kids know and understand what their spirituality is and how they can use that in their life, are we aware or do we live as though we are prepared to die? What do we leave behind? What and I'm not talking about legacy in that selfish sense, but what legacy is left about us when we're past? What will people say about us? Not in their niceties. Oh, he was a great man and a good neighbor. Blah, blah, blah. Or a great woman. Loved her children. Those are all the platitudes that we put out. They may be genuine at times. Maybe many times. But those are the things we say when these things happen. But how would you act differently if you knew what your time was? I look at my friend who died. His name was Chris Wells. Would he have acted any differently had he known death was coming? And so, I want to offer a couple of things up about Chris, uh, my old friend. And at the same time, hopefully encourage us to think about this as we think about our own spirituality, as we think about how we raise our kids. If we don't have kids or they're out of the home or you're single, how we approach spirituality in ourselves. We all have spheres of influence. And I, I remember Ian Punnett, uh, who did the uh, weekend Coast to Coast show uh, on the radio, and uh, he was a big uh, radio personality here in the Twin Cities. Uh, with a morning talk show uh, Monday through Friday on the big powerhouse uh, uh, station here with Clear Channel. And he always would close his show by saying, it is said that we influence over a thousand people in our lifetimes. How will you be influential today? He would always ask that at the close of his show. And so I ask you, everybody, whether you are a parent or a single, whether you're married or, or partnered with somebody or single, um, whether you have children or no children, how do you influence people? What does your life do to influence others? Now, at the same time, the question could be asked, why do I have to worry about how I influence other people? I'm just here to live my life and to enjoy my life and be as happy as possible? And that's a valid question. Maybe we don't want to be influencers. The problem with that is that we all are, whether we want to be or know we are. We're all influencers of people. In my personal life, I influence my wife. I have six children, three grown up from a, a, a previous marriage, and three little ones with my wife, Rainey. And I influence them in everything I do. And the passing of my friend Chris has, and, and even talking about this particular series over the last few days, has made me stop and ask and reconnoiter a bit and reevaluate the things I do. Do I brush off my children do I take time for them? Do I yell at them because I'm frustrated as opposed to them needing an answer? Um, I have to stop and look at those things because we all influence people. And um, with the fear of the danger of being over-emotive, I want to read you a couple of things. This is the, you didn't know this person, maybe a couple of you listening did, and you're in my sphere of influence and the influence of my friends. Um, my friend who passed was Chris Wells. He was somebody I knew from the Minnesota Renaissance Festival. Now, may I say about Chris, we were good friends. But I left the festival back in 2005, came back in 2007, 
And Chris and I, I don't think we'd spoken that whole time from 2007 until now. Not because we had a diminished friendship, but because I lived out of the city, I left the festival, so our contact became almost non-existent. And uh, while we had a couple of niceties we shared every now and then, we just lost contact, as friends do. And it wasn't for any negative reason. It was for the reasons that I was outside that circle of friends. And we didn't brush shoulders anymore. So I read this, uh, this obituary to you because I think it is helpful for all of us to take an inward look. I read through this and I said, there is not a platitude in here. This is all what I knew to be about this man. He was a genuine human being. Christopher Wells, Christopher Patrick Wells, was born on June 20th of 1966 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And he passed away unexpectedly on November 1st of 2019, at home in Minneapolis at the age of 53. He survived by his wife Jennifer and daughter Maggie, Parents, Patrick and Judy, aunts and uncles, and it goes through the list of, of, of people in his family. Um, he is sur also survived by many cousins and an amazing gr group of friends. I'm part of that group. He worked in IT security for 20 plus years at a variety of companies, including most recently Wells Fargo. <coughs> Christopher had an amazing love of life. And this is so true about him. He had an amazing love of life. He was a wonderful husband and father who grew up in Minneapolis and was so happy to share that experience with his beloved daughter, Maggie. He was a graduate of St. Louis Park High School and the University of Minnesota. He was a jester who loved to make people laugh and enjoy life. He was well known for his big heart, loud laugh, and the gusto he put into cooking to make everything perfect for those lucky enough to enjoy his meals. He would go the extra mile for cooking, for a friend, for a stranger, or for anyone who needed it. This is all true about him. He genuinely wanted everyone to have the best time with him, and because of that, with Christopher around, it was easy to have the best time. He loved fishing and camping, especially the annual trips to Tedaguchi State Park and his ice fishing trip with the boys. Christopher believed in chivalry, noble virtue, and giving honor through actions. And by the way, if I can put an aside here, uh, that's uh, the Renaissance Festival part of him that came out in his, his love of doing that as a craft was because of these things in his heart. There were a group of us that I would say, and many people who aren't just your carny type festies that travel with the show, but they are people that bring certain beliefs to what they do. And this is where Chris made an impact for fun at the Renaissance Festival. Uh, he believed in chivalry, noble virtue, giving honor through actions. He worked with his brethren at the Renaissance Festival to create the Order of the Garter, to make sure those qualities lived on in others, which is a part of the legacy he leaves behind. Christopher was very excited about having recently joined the Freemasons as another way to live those qualities. He had just started his journey when it was abruptly ended. His newly found brothers of Cataract Lodge No. 2 will greatly miss him in his spirit. Christopher, Jennifer, Maggie, and Christopher's parents were lucky enough to travel for two weeks to England and Iceland recently, and they will treasure those moments forever. One of Christopher's fondest wishes came true on this trip when he was able to attend a Shakespearean play at the Globe Theater. Quote, From this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few... We happy few. We band of brothers... Shakespeare. The funeral will be held at so-and-so. And then it goes on about the details of that. So this obituary, as I read it, couldn't have been a truer statement 
about a man who sought his own inner spirituality and made that a living thing for the people around him. And he passed this on to his child. And <sighs> while I apologize for the audible pauses in this show, it's hard to talk about these things about an individual without that emotion bubbling to the surface. But at the same time, I'm not attempting to be maudlin or emotive for show. But I think that this is... It embodies things that we should be thinking about and things we should be doing, and it ties in so perfectly with what I've been talking about, about spirituality and passing that on to our children and those around us. This is a very real thing, folks, and it is only hammered home a bit harder with the loss of an old friend. What do we leave behind? What do we pass on? It's not about what will people say about us, but what will we have left in the hearts of other people? This is something that we need to think about every day. And to say to think about it just seems trite. That's not how I mean to say that. These are things we should make a part of who we are. Looking at the death of an old friend is something that raises awareness of mortality. That life is indeed fleeting. That life can be snuffed out in an instant without even a forethought. It reminds me <coughs> of an old tale from the Arabian Nights. And I didn't look this up, so I'm going to try to remember this off the top of my head. There was, in this old tale, a servant who went to the marketplace for his master. And in the dark corners, in the shadows at the marketplace, he saw death lurking and making a grimacing expression at him. In fear for his life, he ran back home and went to his master's feet and said, Master, I just saw death in the marketplace. And he made a grimacing look at me. I fear for my life. And so the master, concerned for the life of his beloved servant, loaded him up with supplies, gave him some money, and said, Go to Baghdad and hide. And so the servant did this. The next day, the servant died in Baghdad. And the master, angered by the death of his servant, went down to the marketplace to look for death hiding in the shadows. And there he did find him. And he approached death and he said, Why did you make a grimacing face at my servant? Why did you take him? And death answered him and said, Oh, I did not make a grimacing face at him. He said, That was merely an expression of surprise. He said, Because I saw your servant here in the local marketplace when I had an appointment with him in Baghdad tomorrow. So, I may have fumbled up that story a bit, but you get the idea that death comes to us all, and we don't always have the ability to know when that's going to happen. So, how are we living our lives? I want to close out this first segment with a poem that one of Chris's other friends, a friend of mine from the festival, 
put up about him, and it's an old familiar poem. He posted Chris's obituary, and he put this poem in, and I cannot remember the author of the poem, but it's O Captain, My Captain. O Captain, my captain, our fearless trip is done. The ship is weathered every rack, the prize we sought is won. The port is near, the bells I hear, the people are exulting. While follow eyes the steady keel, the vessel grim and daring. But, O oh heart, 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 O oh the bleeding drops of red, Where on the deck the captain lies, Fallen, cold, and dead. O oh captain, my captain, rise up and hear the bells. Rise up, for you the flag is flung, For you the, bo the bugle trills, for you the bouquets and ribbon wreaths, for you the shores are crowding, for you they call the swaying mass, their eager faces turning. Here, Captain, dear father, the arm beneath your head. It is some dream that on the deck you've fallen cold and dead. My captain does not answer, his lips are pale and still. My father does not feel my arm. He has no pulse, nor will. The ship is anchored safe and sound, its voyage closed and drone and done. From fearful trip the victor ship comes in with object one. Exult, O shores, and ring, O bells. But I with mournful, mournful tread Walk the deck, my captain lies, fallen cold and dead. There is, in the death of a comrade, which I've experienced too many times, already in my not elderly 58 years. Where you see the prize is won. Life goes on, and what's been left behind has made its impact. But the friend is lost. The life is gone at least on this plane. And we move on to tread with only what we have in memory and instilled in our hearts because the person is gone from our lives, at least temporarily, depending, of course, on what your belief system is. So do we instill in ourselves and in our children these things? How do you appropriate spirituality, and how do you pass it on? Let's dig into that in the next segment. Sit still for two minutes, and I'll be right back.
Hey folks, welcome back from that break. This is Scotty Roberts. You're listening to the Intrepid Radio Program right here on Odyssey Radio Network. And that's at odysy1.com. And you're joining us, I hope, on our simulcast over on my video stream at YouTube. And that is youtube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. Mr. All spelled out. Now, I would like to say a couple of words about uh, John Penman and Penman hats. You see them hanging back here behind me. Those are hats that he has made for me. And if you want to get yourself or a friend or a husband or a wife or somebody a great custom-made, handmade, custom-bespoke hat, go to PenmanHats.com. He is... A friend of mine, and he is all... I will say this, uh, I didn't know John Penman until I bought a hat from him. And that's that first one. That's the one hanging right back there on the wall. And that hat has been around the world and back, and it's a little... wore, wore a hole in the crown uh, by misusing it, and so it just hangs there. Uh, that's my, hat, my Egyptian hat, I call it. And uh, you can avail yourself of... This custom work by John Penman, as you can see here, I wore a little hole right in the crown because I was misusing it, holding it this way. But uh, this was my first hat from Penman. It's his uh, custom reproduction of Humphrey Bogart's hat from the movie Casablanca, and it's called appropriately the Casablanca. So it's a great hat. And uh, the only problem with hats is they give you hat hair. But John Penman... Go check him out. Go get yourself a new lid and uh, take a look at what he has to offer. Uh, so, folks, uh, thanks for sitting through the break. Thanks for coming back from that first segment. We're going to change gears just a little bit, but not extremely, because we're still on the same topic. And uh, I want to talk about this is how we were going to close out our little mini-series here on raising your children to be spiritual people, uh, igniting um, spirituality in your kids, which, by the way, I believe they're born with, but we need to nurture that so they grow up very well-rounded kids into adults. And I've got uh, 10 tips here for raising your child in a spiritual way. Some of them are going to recap some of the things we've already talked about on this show. And I'm going to refer to Serena Dyer. She's the daughter of uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer, who was very famous in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, I believe, a uh, psychologist. And uh, um, she says in my book, Don't Die With Your Music Still In You, which I wrote with my father, Wayne Dyer, we share our insights on a family life with a spiritual bent. And so I'm going to be pulling some information that she writes about. These 10 points are hers from her book. And I believe that her father was uh, co-wrote this with her. Uh, these are ways to describe the spiritual focus with which we can help our children grow up, feeling blessed, feeling empowered, Back, I think Wayne Dyer was one of those first really public psychologists that brought out the whole self-esteem thing, which seems to have become a term we don't use as much anymore. But self-esteem of a child is wrapped around what we pass on to them, what we nurture in them, how we help them grow and understand. If my son or my daughter is confused or depressed, that's generally because there's something I haven't done to help them latch on to the inner spirituality they have to help them process things. I'm not putting all the blame on parents there, but I'm saying parents, we are the ones that are responsible for helping our kids become spiritually minded people. And so here's 10 points um, that will help us raise spiritual children. And you know what? If you don't have children, and as I've said before, don't let that deter you from listening because these are things we can do for ourselves as well. Number one, don't die with your music still in you. 
Think about that statement for a second. It's a poetic way of saying, don't die with what you are being locked up inside. Uh, there's something that's been said too many times to count. Wayne Dyer said this, You'll never regret what you do in life. You will only regret what you don't do. So, I try to make, and I think we should all make, everything that we do to be something that is a takeaway for someone else in our sphere of influence. Yeah, we do little things. We clip our toenails and so I'm not talking about the mundane. I'm talking about the way we deal with life, the way we deal with situations around us, the way we deal with each other. Um, you have to take notice of the things that you're moving toward or that you're moving away from, the things that excite you. If you pay attention and you let yourself be guided by your intuition... You won't have to worry about dying with your music inside you. I have always said my mantra has been that quote of Mark Twain's where he said, um, 20 years from now, you'll regret more the things you didn't do than the things you did do. So cast away from the safe harbor. Set your sails to the trade winds explore, dream, discover. If you make life about developing that metaphoric music that is inside you and letting that guide who you are, then you're going to be somebody who is able to give that to someone else and someone who can rough the storms of life on your own. And the legacy we leave is helping our kids and those around us rough those storms because we've spoken that music, so to speak. We've sung that song. We let it out. And also mixed in with that is this idea of don't put off... What was it? I've said this before. What did John Lennon say, of all people? Um, of course, he was a musician and an artist, so I could expect no less, but he said... Life is that thing that passes you by while you're waiting for it to happen. Don't get into your 50s, your 60s, your 70s and start looking back and saying, oh, I wish I had done that thing back then when... and so on. Don't regret things later. Do them now. Now, I'm not talking about irresponsibility. I'm not talking about relinquishing... Um, the obligations we have or the responsibilities we have, but I'm talking about, say, let's just take going to Egypt. That was something I always wanted to do. And I thought, I'm never going to be able to do it until I actually did it. And then I did it several times after that. It doesn't take much. It takes planning. It takes saving. It takes finding ways to make things work. But you make time for the things that are important. Life is meant to be lived. Life is meant to be happy. And so make those things happen. It really doesn't take a lot. Say, to go to Egypt doesn't take a lot. It takes money for airfare. And it takes money for staying in, in bed and breakfasts or hotels over there. The little local hotels are, are amazing. So uh, there are ways to get around. If money is the only problem, make the money happen. Set some aside. If it takes you a couple of years to save for it, do it. Some people might say, oh, I just can't do that. I, 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 I don't have enough money to save money for a trip. Maybe that's so. But you know what? Don't regret 20 years from now something that you could make happen today. Life is to be done. The music is to be shared. And that, in turn, turns into the things that we pass on to others. Number two, have a mind that's open to everything and attached to nothing. We become what we think about all day long. There's, there's a word for this uh, in certain forms of spirituality. It's manifesting. While you can visualize and manifest 
things that are very positive, we also all day long we can manifest negative things. Oh, I can't do that. Ah, uh, I'm not going to do. Th- I'm not good enough for that. Or I'm not thinking of the poor me's. I'm thinking of the excuses we use to not accomplish the things we want to do. There is a way to do everything, and you've got to find the way. We become what we think about all day long. This is one of the greatest secrets that so many people are unaware of as they live out their life. Maybe their mission in life, uh, their their life's work. How many stunted artists do we have out there or flailing business people because they have never put it to the test and they've never stepped out and set their sails to the trade winds? What we think about is the business of our minds. If that inner invisibleness called our mind is closed to new ideas and infinite possibilities, it's the equivalent to killing off the most important aspect of our very humanity. Don't get stuck in the day-to-day of, i got to pay my mortgage or my rent, I've got to fix my car, I've got to mow the lawn, I've got to cook for the kids, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to run here, i got to run there, i got to be at my job. If I don't punch on time, I get fired, blah, blah, blah. All of those things are necessary things of life, obligations we have. But in doing that, we get lost in the things that are the most important aspects of our humanity, of who we are. Those get pushed down, and they're under the surface. And later, if we don't do something about them, they become the regrets later in life that we did not do. I wish I had kissed that girl. I wish I had held that guy's hand. I wish I had stepped out and made my voice heard. I wish I had gone to that place or done that thing. Those are the regrets we have. A mind that's open and unattached to any one particular way of being or living is like having an empty container that can be allowed to be new and endless possibilities to enter and to be explored. Those are the things that make us who we are. Don't define yourself by your limitations. God, I don't want to sound rah-rah, motivational speaker-ish here. That's not what I'm after. I'm just saying we all have the ability to do the things that are really the inner joys and happinesses that will make us who we want to be. And so many of us don't because we're just afraid to take that step or find ways to make excuses to not take that step. The possibilities are endless. 20 years from now, you'll regret more the things you didn't do than the things you did do. Number three, you can't give away what you don't have. It may seem impossible now, but one day we're all going to look back at the storms we've weathered and we're going to say thanks for that. Thanks, universe. Thanks, God. Thanks, whoever, for those storms. For many of us, it's the storms of our lives that have given us compassion. It molds our kindness and our gentleness that we otherwise may not have known. It helps us explore the unexplored. And that which we can now give away to others and our kids, especially because those are things that are inside us. We've developed those things. So take this time to develop those things. Look at the setbacks as stepping stones. Look at the things you want to do, the goals you want to accomplish, the mission you want to fulfill. What is your... Have you ever defined your own mission? What's your mission in life? The easiest answer is, oh, I don't know. Yeah, sure you know. I don't know is always a dead excuse to me. It's the way we brush off what we already know and we just don't want to vocalize. You can't give away what you don't have. So develop what you have. Number four, embrace 
silence. I've long known that there's a wisdom that's inherent in the ancient aphorism, quote, it's the silence between the notes that makes the music, end quote. This is a truth that we all attempt to convey and pass on to our children as we seek to make our homes temples or uh, 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 sanctuaries of serenity and of peace amidst all the activity of the world around us. Everything emerges out of silence. Sometimes silence, not sometimes, meditation requires silence. Contemplating where you're going, what you're doing, how you're going to pass that on requires the silence. It's the silence between the notes that makes music. Number five, give up your personal history. Our personal history, of course, uh, is all the things in our background that keep us the same, that keep us non-changing, non-moving, non-developing, non-growing. If more of the same is not what we want, then we have to let go of our history. And when we do, we let go of all the beliefs we've had about ourselves. Beliefs which might not even be true, folks. In letting go of the past, you have to find, and you're going to find, that you're able to be more alive in the present. If you don't like where you are in life, then you have to change your way of thinking. You have to let go of your history. Now, it's been said, of course, about history, that those unwilling to learn the lessons from history are bound to repeat it. Learning the lessons of history is the process of letting go of it, breaking the chains. Some of you out there, and I know some of you personally, you have abuses from the past. Not everybody has the same abuses and the same stories, but we all have our stories. But those things, abuses, bad experiences, negatives, those are the things that set us on the path of where we're going. And we many times trap ourselves in that past. It's not forgetting it, it's releasing it that is necessary. If I let my past control who I am now, I may miss opportunities. Let's use the obvious example, in love. I was so burned by someone that I can never love that way again. I'll never open myself up again to to a new person. And so we end up judging any new person that comes along by the patterns of the past hurts or abuses or pains. And we let that suffering in our history dictate how we treat the new person. And the new person generally will come out eventually and say, hey, I'm not that old person in your life. And it can ruin any opportunity there. That's an example of this. Give up your personal history. Hang on to it for for reference points. Learn from it, but let it go. And you know what that is? That is not easy. That's a cognitive act of the will. Let go of something. When you hang on to something, I, I must have this pain in my life. You're not letting it go. You have to consciously let go of that grip and move into something that's a learning experience from it so you can share that and become a fuller person yourself. Six, you can't solve a problem with the same mind that created the problem. Oh, yeah? I could regularly remind the children in my family that their concept of themselves is nothing more than all of the things they believe to be true. If your children grow up and they watch the way you do things, they will accept that as the truth of life. And if what they believe to be true is helping them to create situations in which they're unhappy or even unhealthy, they're then challenged to change what they have unwaveringly held on to as an absolute truth of how life works. This is really difficult. 
for most people to wake up to. There's a good version of woke, which I hate that word. But when you wake up, you see these things. And it's a difficult process. And this is why so many stay stuck, because they'd rather be right than be happy. I know uh, my wife and I, we saw a marital therapist a few years back. We had some problems we were trying to iron out. And after listening to us both for a little bit, he said, I'm going to ask you one question. He said, do you want to be right or do you want to be married? And this is the question we have to ask about a lot of things in our lives. You can't solve the problem with the same mind that created the problem. Sometimes you have to sacrifice being right for being better. We all have to do that. Number seven, there are no justified resentments. Resentment, you can't justify resentment. Growing up, there was a five-letter word beginning with a B that, I'm just going to say it, bitch, that we used. No, uh, not talking about that one specifically. The real bad word in our household and even in our current household, is blame. Blame. The B word. We need to build in ourselves a resentment for resentment. Uh, we can't place the blame on someone else or something else other than ourselves. The way we process something, the way we blame is an excuse in our life to not do something the way we should do it. I'm blaming that person. Well, I hit my head on the cabinet door because you opened it up and left it open. Well, I didn't look before I bowed my head down to look for something, so I nailed my head. I don't blame somebody. I just This is life. This is what happens. Freedom comes in forgiveness. Letting go. Let go of your history. When you free yourself of your past and your past resentments, you release yourself from the worry of the future. You don't let your past control you or a person who has made you think a certain way in your past if you let that person control you, that person is in control of your life and you're passing blame onto them. You have to let that go. Forgiveness is as easy as saying... And forgiveness, by the way, doesn't mean forgetfulness. It means... I, I heard it once said, uh, I forgive you... Uh, how did that go? Um, my forgiveness of you... Oh, I can't remember the phrase. I, I'm sorry, I, I started on that and I can't finish that phrase. can't remember where it went, but the idea is that I forgive whether the other person deserves it or not, in my own mind. I always said to the kids in my youth group, if you are the offender, be the first person to go back and make it right. If you are the offended, be the first person to go back and make it right. None of us are released from those things. So forgiveness is something that we do because it's good for us to forgive. you got to release the past. If you live your life by justifying your resentments, then you're not going to grow. You're not going to go anywhere. It's that same thing of releasing your past. It's that same thing of you can't solve a problem with the same mind of the problem that created the problem. You have to give up your personal history. How can you pass anything good on to your kids when this is what you do? Now, we're only down to two minutes. I got two of these, three of these left. Number eight, treat yourself as if, you've already, as if you already are what you'd like to be. This is that whole thing of manifesting. The greatest gift that any of us are, are granted is the gift of our imaginations. Every single thing that now exists was once imagined. And the corollary of this assertion is that everything that is ever going to ha exist in the future must first be imagined. In my role as a father, 
and in a way a teacher, I feel it's incumbent upon me to help my children understand and apply the phenomenal implications of this basic notion. If you want to accomplish anything, you must first be able to expect it of yourself. Now, am I perfect at that? No. I sometimes am pissy. I sometimes get on my kids. I sometimes get on my wife. And more than the good ways. And But what we're doing is we're doing what in the previous points, we're passing blame. And we're not treating ourselves as if we're already where we need to be or want to be. Number nine is treasure your divinity. When we were little, uh, my brother and my sister and I were taught by my mom that God resided in each of us. Now, she was no theologian, but that's what we were basically taught. Our divinity isn't something we needed to go out and look for. Instead, we would find it when we looked inward. And I think that's what many of us don't do. We're governed by our externals rather than by what we know internally to be true. We just don't manifest it. We don't let that happen. We get so bound up in the day-to-day stuff of life that we forget about living happily. We forget about developing ourselves so we can pass that on to our kids. And the, the last one, and I'm right out of time, wisdom is avoiding all thoughts that make you weak. All I want for my kids and all of those who, who uh, are in my circle of influence is to realize that they could always choose a thought that would empower them. I want my wife to be empowered. I want my kids to be empowered. As opposed to the things that make us fragile and weak. And this is one of the greatest lessons we can all use each and every day of our lives. Wisdom is avoiding all the thoughts that weaken you. Or as the children uh, have heard me say from time to time, your life is the product or the consequence of the choices you make. So make good choices. Sometimes we say that in anger. Choose better, you little... And sometimes it's with sincerity. So there you go. We're out of time, and so I have to wrap this up. But all of you, take these 10 points and apply them to yourselves. Become somebody who doesn't rest in the past, but who manifests who you really are in the future. Let your music play, so to speak. Thanks for listening. We're going to go out for a 23-hour break, and we'll be back. So sit tight.